Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode four of Lewis Bloor's Game Changers. Today, I introduce you to a friend of mine from the fitness and coaching world. He's currently the strength and conditioning coach for some top level athletes, including boxers, footballers, and UFC stars. And he's the owner of coaching and online fitness business, McFarlane Training Systems. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ricky McFarlane. Right, Ricky, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on, mate. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well. I must say, I know since the last time we've seen you that your business has, has been started doing well, but I've never seen a man get, th- about. you've had about 20, 25 messages and phone calls literally in the space of about nine minutes. No, no, yeah. Is that, and that's what it's like that's all day right now. All day, every day, Saturday, Sunday, 12 o'clock at night. But that's, it's, it's a good thing. It is a good thing. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, you you pray to be busy when you ain't busy, and then when you are busy, you think, oh, I wish I would have like, a little bit of quiet time, but I wouldn't wish for it to be anything else at the minute. Mm. So I um, this is us. This is obviously the second week of podcast. Yesterday, I had three coffees before uh, midday, and it rattled my brain. I, I reckon I got about four or five hours of sleep yesterday, um, and I definitely feel a little bit behind the pace today. Yeah. Um, and you said you'd had about a million energy drinks yesterday too. Yeah. Now for anyone that knows me, <laughs> as you know, knows from our coffee consumption and yeah. my caffeine consumption. Um, I think yesterday, I had, before 8 a.m., I'd had four double espressos. Wow. And then by the end of the night, yeah, I'd had six double espressos during the day and four um, knockos and two Red Bulls. Well, the thing is, where you're taking people and training them every hour of the day. Did you say you had 15 clients today? Mm. Right, so you need to start every single one with full energy. So yeah. you're you're running on Red Bull and other energy yeah. drinks right now. You do need to stay mentally alert. That is the issue, mm. is staying mentally alert. And especially if you you know, you know care as much as, you, as you know, I'd like to think I do about each fighter or each athlete, then it takes so much thought for everyone in their sessions. So staying alert is probably the biggest issue. Mm. So you've got a, you've got a large stable of growing talents, some yeah. very well established talents as it is. Let's start let's start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about your sporting history um and how how you came up as an athlete. Okay, yeah, um, I, I come from a big sporting family. There's you know, in our extended family there's premiership footballers, there was professional boxers, big big boxing background. Um my dad was a footballer. Played over a thousand games in the conference, Conference South and uh, non-league football, but was then a manager. I worked for him as a manager. Um, my own sporting career, I was a bit too chunky at school to play football, and I think my dad was a bit upset because I, I looked like uh, Andy Ruiz running around in a football kit, but um, <laughs> ended up playing rugby at school and uh, gave a good crack. You know, I, I loved it, so my dad said, look, if you're going to do it, let's do it properly, and uh, gave a good crack. Ended up at Isle Queen's Rugby League for a while. And then did the rounds. I played, played for Cambridge, played for Barking when they was flying in League One, League Two, and then um, went back to Cambridge. Had to retire early due to injury. From there, it comes to the decision: what do I want to do in my life now? Do I want to go and be a builder or a carpenter, or do I want to stay in sport? And I always had a massive uh, love for training. I was always over training, always in the gym when I was told not to be, always out running, believe it or not. And uh, so I thought, well, to be involved, I don't want to coach the sport. I want to be involved in another department. Just go down the strength and conditioning route. I think strength and conditioning is something where you really, really have an impact. You know, you see people over the course of a 12-week camp get stronger, fit, fitter, faster. And if you're working with a boxer or any kind of athlete football, you know, whatever it is over a two, three-year period, you will craft a, a strong human. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really miss my, my PT Um my favourite thing was doing pads. I used to absolutely love doing pads and, and, and building someone up from not really being, you know, listen, I never looked after elite level boxers, but seeing people come in, even if it was like two mums coming in of an evening, not being confident in throwing a jab, teaching them how to put their feet down at the right time. Um, it's rewarding. Oh, it's, there's hugely. a massively rewarding side to it. Um, you know, training that physical fitness and seeing people improving. It's definitely something I miss. I mean, I, I broke my hand, so I had to stop doing pads. Naturally fell back to working in the city after that. But um, I try and, I'm, I'm, I've organized a little uh, WhatsApp group chat got about 10 of the boys in there and we try and get down the gym once a week yeah. and I love it I get down there and you know I'm pushing everyone hard um, and it's something that I really love however if you're doing it 15 20 hours a day it can it's, oh. a, it's a job it's a it job it's a job it? yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and you know some days you do have that that feeling where you think this is, uh, this is a long day but then I think well, well what could I be doing that I weren't enjoying I love my job mm. in the days it's not a job I, I'm excited to go work I'm excited to be around the lads um, you know, 
it's like being, I tried to explain it to someone the other day. I said, it's almost like being at school with your mates, but I'm 29. And you're, go you're going for belts. You're going for winning, whether that be a, um, a fight or whether it be a match. You're go you're, you're th th that is work that you're doing, which I think, you know, having that physical environment where you're all pushing and you're all, you know, th th there's a camaraderie to that, mm. which really helps self-esteem, mental health as well. Wh whether you're doing it at a, an elite level or just, you know, four of your mates going down the boxing gym yeah. every Friday. There's something that you really, really get from that. Um, and it's something that I think people don't do enough in this country. But obviously you've... You are, if not now, you're well on your way to becoming one of the top strength and conditioning coaches in the country yeah. with the stable that you've got. But so thank you. Let's take it back a little bit, you know, to the past from that. Your qualifications, what were the first things you did before you really, really got into your speciality? Or did you go to become a strength and conditioning coach and that's where you started? You knew that's where you wanted to put your time into straight away? Yeah, I think because of, I was never the greatest um Athlete, you know, I, I was an okay technically rugby player. I was an okay athlete. I, I was a bit overweight as a kid, but then I got myself super fit. My whole career was built on hard work, and because of that, and I always thought, well, I, I used to watch loads of videos. And when YouTube was first about, I'd be watching Joe DeFranco and these NFL players and stuff like that, and I'd be thinking well, why are they getting so much faster? Why are they getting so much stronger? Why are they more durable? And it led to me to reading a lot and I was always a bit of a nose. Like we'd be in S and C sessions at a club and I'd be like, well, can't we try this? Can't we try that? Mm. Like it probably annoyed, because it would annoy me sometimes now if it have had a long day and someone's going to me, oh yeah, but this bloke, this bloke said do this. And I was always asking questions and it was almost like a natural progression um, that, you know, I was always an inquisitive and hardworking athlete and it just kind of led me into that that road of... Well, I think following your curiosity is definitely something that no matter what career you end up in, I mean, you know, I'm I'm doing podcasts now because for me, that's my entertainment. That's yeah. what, you know, this isn't something that's just popped up overnight. I've spent the past year, whenever I go to the gym, whenever I've got a bit of free time, when I'm cleaning the flat, whether I've got a long drive to do, I put a podcast on yeah, and so that's my curiosity. And I feel like once you find out truly what you're interested in, that's going to shine a light on what you should probably spend your time doing as well. Yeah. So if you're if you're putting in more work and research into the newest techni uh, techniques for strength and conditioning than the guy who's taking your sessions, that tells you that you should probably be taking the sessions in time once oh, you've, once yeah. you've honed your craft. Um, so what qualifications did, did you start with? Or was it all... Because YouTube, you can learn yeah, anything I've, from. I, I've got Is, boxers. They'll come in and say something to me and... You know, I don't, I don't admit to be right about everything because you're never going to be right about everything. They'll come in and say something to me, and I'll, I'll go. I think, yeah, he's right. And then I'll have a, I'll have a little tinker. I'm not, you know, I'm not too pr proud to say, no, we're doing it my way. Yeah. I will always flex. Like some, you know, people's bodies are their bodies. They know how their body feels. And if they think something doesn't quite work, and the science and the results are showing that it probably ain't working, I'll change it. Mm. Like, it's no, there's no, there's no egos here. Um, during my last spell at Cambridge, it weren't full-time rugby. Well, it was, but it wasn't. Um, so I moved up there. I was there full-time. I had nothing to do. So I enrolled in a degree, like a distance learning degree, sports science. From there, got so how did how did sorry to interrupt? How did you go about doing the long distance? That was online. Yeah, yeah, wow. ninety percent online. And then I, I, it's it's hard because. I I was a player, but I basically shadowed all my SNC coaches my whole career. I was shadowed everyone. So I had a great base of knowledge going into uni in, in the first year anyway. Um like I was getting ninety four percent in my in my exams and stuff like that. Not wow. because of I was overly bright, because I wasn't overly bright. You can see my, my exam cards at secondary school, but I was so obsessed with learning what I was seeing and what I was doing, I just, just didn't stop reading. Even to, even to now, I'll, I'll go home and my wife will go, are we watching another another video or another yeah, thing? Yeah. Tonight? Or are you listening to another podcast? I'm like, yeah. See, that's 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 one of the things. Like, I, I would disagree in the sense of, you know, not not saying you're putting yourself down, but mm. you clearly are inc you clearly are incredibly intelligent and incredibly bright at that chosen field. You don't, you that's, know, you don't you don't need to be. Um, that's where I think this country goes so wrong educationally because. If I look at the way I was taught, was it the correct way for me? No, I can't be rigid. So I have to be in my own environment, 
relaxed. If it's rigid, I won't learn. Yeah. I've, I, and again, I, this is one of the main reasons I'm buzzing about doing this podcast because I feel like I've got a lot of information that I've picked up over the years that I'm not necessarily sure if it's true or not. <laughs> Mom, do you know what I mean? So yeah. I'm going to say this and someone's probably going to write in and say, no, mate, you got, got that completely yeah. wrong. <laughs> I have heard somewhere along the line, I think Russell Brand might have said it, that the school system um, that is used uh, in the UK and Europe was designed by a Dutch general to create soldiers that could um, do basic maths, orienteering, all that kind of stuff. So, so they make people adequate to a certain level, but it's, that kind of schooling is not going to make you a specialist in any, even you go through sixth no. form, maybe uni, you end up doing a master's. That's the only time you're going to begin to specialise properly into something. Yeah. So, or express. Yeah, yeah. and... Um, you know, it is interesting to, to hear you say that you don't necessarily wouldn't consider yourself a bright person because for me sitting here talking to you, I would consider you a specialist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I just think it, it's one of those things where if I was always a bit boisterous and a bit, you know, ADHD in a way, like I never really wanted to conform in mm. a way. Not naughty. I was, I, was, I was cheeky in school, not naughty, but I, I never wanted to conform and maybe that was why I was able to express myself and go to the path that I, I wanted to. Because you see, I know it's a lot of stuff, like my first couple of years working as a PT, I worked in the city. Mm. And the one major thing I used to, I, I noticed and it used to gripe me so bad was if anything was out of a straight line in terms of, say, if you said, right, let's express something, like there was nothing. that It would just go to pandemonium. Or if, for example, if you was teaching a class and it was A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but they weren't lined up, dead straight, people got confused. Right. So, And I just think that that is a product of probably our education. So are we, are we talking about the kind of, um, the com the mass, you know, the larger gyms, like, you know, you've got your Virgins, you've got your David Lloyds, things yeah. like that, the ones that are in the city that are just businesses at the end of the day. Yeah, they are. And there is a, there is a real value going to your, not, I'm not saying lower level personal trainers, I'm saying more independent personal trainers. Yeah, For, what, what I've found, um, when I was personal training myself and I would charge a fee, a lot of personal trainers would say to me, well, that's quite a small fee. And I'd say, well, hold on a minute. You're charging 80, 90 quid for an hour, but your gym is taking 55 pounds yeah. of that. So I'm charging 50, 60% of that fee, yeah. um, but that's my money. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And I feel like there is a real, there's, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? There is a culture that is dominated by a lot of the money that's in the PT industry does go through places like Virgin, um, David Lloyd. And I feel like, it's difficult for PTs to make careers there. Oh, I feel true. like if you want to be a personal trainer, you've got to create your own brand. You've got to specialize at a certain niche and you've got to just believe in it and really, oh, really stick to it. And I think that's, you know, the hardest times of, of my, you know, I'll say the start of personal training career was in the city. Um, it's such a flooded market. And there was times we're thinking, I remember saying to, well, I see my wife now, but my girlfriend then, I'm, like, I don't think this is, is for me. And she was like, no, you've got to stick to this. Like, this is what you're you're made to do. And then as soon as I thought, this is not my market, pull out. I had a few fighters anyway, and a lot of footballers, but I sort of a pull out to went boom. So for me, it's, it's more, you've got to sit and think, is this the industry or the market I've, I, I'm intending to be? And if not, then you're probably not going to thrive there. How did you first go, once you first decided, right, I'm qualified, I'm now out, you know, wet behind the years, haven't got your very first client yet. How did you, how did you get clients? What was your, because that's one thing that PT struggle with massively. And that's one of the main reasons why people do go to your places like Virgin and David yeah. Lloyd, because they believe they're going to get fed these clients. Then they spend a year, two years walking on the gym floor. Um, word of, you know, word of mouth. Um, training friends, training their parents, hoping their parents' mates will then book them and stuff. And, and there's no real platform at the moment that PTs can just sign themselves up to, put their criteria in, and then boom, you start getting messages through. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. how, how did how did you start? How did you go about getting your client base up? Uh, fighter wise, it's quite funny. I, so you was doing some you was training fighters straight away. I had one one kid, and he was really gangly, skinny. Wanted to, be a, wanted to be a UFC star and he come to me and he was like, you know, I need to be stronger. I'm getting I'm getting mangled at jiu-jitsu. Mm. I'm getting mangled at tie fighting. And so I sat down, wrote a plan out for him what I thought would work. And, you know, a good four months later, he started coming out, oh, my jiu-jitsu coach wants to meet you. My, my tie coach wants to meet you. I'm, I'm stronger. I'm beating people in sparring. 
So I ended up going down. It was still at a time I was fresh out of rugby. I was you know, six months out of rugby, still had issues trying to work out what I was going to do in my life. I thought, you know, it, like every young rugby player, I thought I was going to play for England, mm. but, you know, whether it happened or not. Went down there and got involved in a jiu-jitsu session. Had no skill whatsoever, just like, you know, idiot power. And ripping people's arm yeah, arms off. Yeah, yeah. So I started throwing people about <laughs> and it got me told off at another jiu-jitsu club. But it's yeah. all I had. I would, you know, if, if you know, where we come from, if someone tries to strangle you and you can't strangle them back, what are you going to do? You're going to throw them. Yeah, well, that's that, 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 it's a very different kind of, um, you know, culture. we used to box in gyms and you get in there and if you're not technical, you, you, you're you have to get high levels. You use your strengths. But in there, it's, I mean, I've not been, but like Brazilian jiu-jitsu and stuff is definitely something I want to get yeah. involved in because it is, they're smooth. When you see people who are trained relaxed. doing it, it's really weird because you'll see someone straight and they'll just be like, yep, tap. And then I was a bit like a social grenade guy. And I just went, there was, <laughs> body, there was bodies. <laughs> Literally bullying a china shop. But but from it, I thought, like, the guy was like, oh, can I speak to you afterwards? And I thought, oh, I'm going to get told off and like beat up here or something. Yeah. And he was like, oh, I've got someone I would like you to work with. He's, he's going to be a world champion. And it turned out to be Terry Brazier and he turned out to win two world titles and was steamrolling people physically. And wow. Got a bit of a claim for that and you know, a bit of notice. Mm. And to be fair to him, he shouts me out every single day almost. Mm. From there well, I feel like one thing I see through Instagram, and you know, I'm dying to come down to the gym. I'm, I'm just working all the hours under the sun at the moment. But as soon as I do get a bit of free time, I'm going to come. Yeah. One thing I've definitely noticed through your Instagram is your connection with your with your squad, with your fighters. It's it seems really. like every single person who comes in, sometimes you're doing group sessions, sometimes you've got the one-on-ones. Your content's constantly going up, which is great for the business. But I see the work. They're all in there. Grafting. Grafting. Together. Yeah. With that That's... So when I went to... I, I did an internship in America and the, the one thing I noticed was the community space of it. Like, on a Friday, it was Max Out Friday, we used, we used to call it, and everyone would be three or four giant coffees in, the music would be blaring, the gym would stink of sweat, but it was like nothing I'd ever... It was like electric. Yeah. And... It's something primal, isn't it? it it's something... It, it was just... I, we used to be driving there and I, it was... I, I used to I used to explain it to him because there'd be NFL players in there. Tommy Bahannon went and played, you know, eight years in the NFL. There'd be Olympians. It was just ridiculous. The beast. Oh, beast. just monsters everywhere. And it would be electric. It'd be like game day. Yeah. It was as nerve wracking, but as exciting as game day. And I come back to England and I was like, I can't find that anywhere. And I was trying to create with my mates and I'd, I went for about 25 gym partners because they just couldn't keep up with it. I feel like it's, um, it's not... It, you know, people do have this division between um, being an intellectual or being a physical person. And we all need, we all need both. We all need part creative of outlets makeup. and we all need to have, not that physical, not, not physical in the sense you go to the gym, you do 20 minutes on the treadmill, um, you know, thousand meters on the row up. But no, 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 you need to go in there and Grunt give it and everything. Give because it. if you do that once or twice a week, oh, you're going to be, huge. you're going to be much happier. It's and, huge. and it's just something that, I've gone through years where I've, um, you know, not necessarily years, but I've gone through years where I've trained more and, and ones where I haven't. And it's just, I know that feeling of turning up and unleashing everything you've got. And but at the end of it, you feel like you're never going to catch your breath again. And yeah. then by the time, you know, half an hour, hour later, you, you are on a high. Yeah. You really are on a high. And it's something that people need to do more. And um, one of the things that people have said about the podcast when people are watching is that I'm looking at my phone, but that's because I've got notes. And funnily enough, one of the notes that I've got here is what is the difference between American gyms and the UK gyms? And, and you, you've touched on that. Yeah, I think, um, which is, I think, what we've actually managed to create in our gym is a community. Um, like, we're, everyone on the boys is in a WhatsApp group, same WhatsApp group. They go to each other's fights. Now, you'd think I was like a striking coach or not with just a strength conditioning company, yeah. but... They go to each other's fights. They're cheering each other on. They're, they're like tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. I'll have 25 of them over a hill in Hainault in, in Essex, and they will be beasting each other. Mm. And they're all trying to beat each other. They're all trying to edge each other on. And that community is creating success because, you know, you know, and I know. If I go in the gym and, I, and me and you train together, and I bench press 100 kilos, yeah. and you bench press 90, you're yeah. going away thinking, I want to bench press 105. Yeah. And all that does is just raise the level. It's healthy competition, isn't it? And um, one thing that I think with that is, if any of these go, if any of these boys go out and you know touch wood, they don't happen. But if any of them go out and they lose, they've got a community to fall back on. Huge. Where, which is one of the yeah, biggest massive. things about being a fighter and being a contender is, look, unless you are the anomaly to the rule, you're going to take an L at one point. And you, and having those 20, 25 people around there, massive. you're going to have people that have already been there and dealt with it, and you're going to have people that are on the come up and say, look, I look up to you as a fighter you, you know, come back yeah. from it. And that's, that's something Massive, that must... I, and, I, and I must admit, like, 
people look at me and like, that's, that's mad, that's crazy. I've turned big names down in the past because I know that it's going to upset the balance of what we've got. Mm. But I'm talking big names and look, and it, whether they clash with weight classes in our gym, whether they're not the right person. I, if, if you upset that community, then you've lost the whole dynamic. Mm. Our dynamic is that we're a community. of, of They're all athletes. We've got a, f- a few coaches, me, Adam, Big Paul, Thomas. Uh, I call him Big Paul because he's six foot eight and a half. Um, that it works so well because it's like a, it, it's a, what's, what's the, it's like a storm in a teacup. Mm. If you come into it, people like people were watching that some of the boys run the other day, and the other Up boys the hill, are yeah. shouting at them and screaming, laughing, and one one of the mums was sitting in the gym. Like, it's crazy, yeah. But to us, it just works. Yeah, it, it works. It, it's a necessity for training because there's only so far you can go alone as yeah. someone who's constantly yeah. pushing their body. You need to enjoy unless it. Unless you're and when an you've, internal psychopath, yeah. You need unless, some pushing. yeah, unless you've got that, you know just something that's not quite all there and you've got yeah. some serious self-loathing going on inside and you're going to push yourself. You, you do need to enjoy it. You yeah. know? It's, it's, still, it's still a job, isn't it? It's still a career yeah. at the end of the day and you've got to enjoy your work. So having that, and, and you know, it's tangible. I can see it through your, uh, I can see it through your videos. Um, so that's something that you've taken from your time out in the US. Yeah. Let's, let's go through a bit of what happened out there because I've heard you on another podcast before and, when, and this is when I've just started to get my idea through of, you know, I'd like to do it. And um, I listened to those American guys talking to you and they was weightlifters. You was talking about fighting and stuff and it was quite, it, it was a the very, very days. good podcast. But the gym was called MASH? Yeah, MASH Elite Performance, yeah. Right, I've not looked it up. Tell me about it. Uh, Travis MASH was once the strongest person on earth. So this was a weightlifting gym, yeah? He was a powerlifter. And he, had, he had some... Outrageous records. He squatted a thousand pounds at ninety kilo body weight. So what's that? It's about five hundred kilos at ninety kilo body weight. Deadlifted eight fifty pounds at ninety kilo body weight, which is an absolute monster. Ex college football player. Went to the Olympic Training Centre for Olympic weightlifting as well. Put up massive numbers. Then obviously dropped into the coaching arena and has just developed. Everyone that leaves Mash, if they're nothing, they're brutally strong. They are brute animals. And you'd go in there and it, the atmosphere, people talk about West Side Barber when the atmosphere is crazy. You go to MASH on a Friday and you, you know, you think someone's going to get hurt with the intensity in there. Yeah. It, it was Lifting just, obscene weights. Oh, my first day there, I always remember my first day, I absolutely cacked myself. <laughs> Greg Knuckles, who's like a multiple time world record holder. I'd never seen 350 kilos on a bar. Like, you know, they have special bars because surely. Yeah, they've got like, you know, stronger yeah, bars. Yeah, yeah. In our gym, I was probably the strongest. You know, I had some decent numbers going out there. And then the first session, someone asked me to spot Greg, and I think he'd done seven reps with 700 something pounds, which, which was just absolutely absurd. I mean, my legs shaking more than these was. Just they must have double wide doors because surely these guys oh, are walking huge. through. Like Even now, Greg, you'd look at Greg, you walk in, you think, oh, he's, he's come in the wrong shop. He's going to a like, PlayStation shop or something. And then he'd put. A huge amount of weight on the bar, and you had Travis, that was 42 years old, still pulling 700 off the floor, and it was just ridiculous. There was 16 year old kids stronger than me. I was 24, Mad. and I'm like the tiny kids. Like, and would people come from all over America to do yeah, that? All over the world. Yeah, we had we had 10 lads that were all Division One college football players. We had NFL in there, like I said. Mm. It was just absolutely absurd. I think there's a real culture out for. Um the physical side of life in America, I think it's probably to do with people can are a little bit more outdoorsy. There's a yeah. lot of kind of farm hands and people that are just naturally in physical roles. Whereas in the UK, I would think the most prominent um, training culture would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think especially in London, I'd say your things like Barry's boot camp is, you know, these ones where it's classes, people turn up, they do, the, and, and I'm not putting it down at all no. because they're great institutions, but there is that difference between, I mean, what, what participation. Yeah, that's what, the main thing I find. I think we've become a, you know, we have become, pardon the pun, a participation nation. How, how, how we're so mean? scared of failure that we'd rather not have competition. Mm. Like you see it a lot with young athletes. They're so, their parents are so set, set scared of them getting beaten that they just create this environment where they're never wrong. Mm. So then when they get to that top level and they might not be good enough for that top level, they can't take it. So I was always, my dad was always brutally honest. If I was bad, I was bad. If I was good, I was good. So I learned to take, you know, if you get praised, take them like a champion. If you get, if you get told, I've had some, you know, I've had some bollockings in my time, at half time, and I'm thinking, I, like, you're talking to me as if you're going to beat me up. Well, that's 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 the thing about sports, isn't it? There is no, 
you know, it is either win or lose. Yeah. And, you know, depending on what you want to get out of it, if, if you know, you need to be honest about where the mistakes have been made yeah. and improved. But, if, but so, so, so what age would you say for, for that you were actually really, really exposed to sport at, at a serious level? Oh, yeah. my life. Yeah. My dad was... He used, he used to have a say, he drilled a saying into it. I still say it to my, my athletes today. Like, I mean, from an early age, you're either pregnant or you're not. Yeah. Anyone who goes, what does that mean? Went, well, you're either professional or you're not. You can't be half professional in your approach. You can't eat right for three days a week and then go on the booze and expect to do well on the weekend. Yeah. Ain't gonna happen. I think I, I, I hear a lot of footballers that um, I might know from just the area or, you know, a, a friend of a friend that you, you might be semi-pro or was looking like they're going to be pro, but then they get caught up in the social uh, life it's of, of, um, of just their schoolmates and mm. going out, girls and things like that. Whereas... I think in the US, and I, you know, again, I might be completely wrong here, but if you want to, if you want to take stuff seriously, there's much more of a of a proven pathway where they yeah. will have institutes, they will have coaches that bring up kids and and make sure that they are on the right path, doing the right things. And it's not like, you know, oh right, okay, so I'm getting involved into football or boxing, but I travel 45 minutes to the club and I just come home at the weekends. It's like, no, you've got to, you've got to go six hours across yeah. country and you it's ain't going home at the weekends. So we had we had 12 year olds with nutritionists. Mad, isn't it? We had. I always remember it was a, it was quite expensive. I'm sorry, Trevor, if I'm telling your prices. <laughs> I think it was about three hundred dollars a month for kid, and we had sixty kids a class. Wow! And they were eight years and old. And these were parents that Some wanted them in to become strongmen. The next NFL, the next. You know, lacrosse, uh, softball for the girls was massive. We had some star softball players. And what was the dynamic between between the parents that you saw out there? And, you know, was it ever close to the line where you thought people weren't yeah. being looked after? It was, yeah. yeah. And is that something that you think... That's everywhere, just, though. That's just runs through sport. That's as everywhere, yeah. 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 That's everywhere, you know. It, if a kid wants to succeed, it will succeed. Obviously, you've got to push, push a kid a bit, I think, um, because they're not... You know, they haven't seen that life experience yet where they know their decision ain't going to affect... They don't know that what decision's not going to affect them. But out there, there's definitely there's more money in it. Huge amounts of money. Do you think for you that because you've had that... Um, the patron side of it and your dad pushed you for, because of sport, um, as a kid that... There were probably times where if he pushed you as hard as you're saying, there were probably times where you thought, God, this is you, like maybe, as you said, with the half time thing. Um, do you think now that you're on the other side of it and you're training these guys, you understand much more where that come from? Because you oh, want them to I'm win. You want them to be safe and you want them to not get hurt. So you are now the one pushing. Yeah. Does it make sense a little bit more now? I'm like, I couldn't thank my dad enough for what he did. Right. So, yeah. So, like, I, I would so like, like, like I said, if I was good, he would say you were good. Mm, mm. Uh, but then I'll come off the pitch sometimes and he's been like, I always remember one sticks in my head. I've got man of the match. And he went to me, oh, you're putting a bit of weight. And I was like, yeah, I've just got man of the match. He went, well, fair enough. Yeah. Like, that was it. But like, if, if I was bad, like when he used to kick off on the pitch and stuff like that, he didn't want me being involved in that because he see that as unprofessional yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. I think so. it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a father's role to be... Um, you know, especially it's a father's role to teach a boy how to be a man, I yeah, believe, you know, and, and the mothers, you know, and again, I don't want people biting my head off here saying, oh, no. you're being gender or whatever. It takes a man to, to raise a man, oh, I believe, huge. you know, and it takes it takes a man to bring out that physical. You, yeah, you if you don't do what's necessary, you won't get what you want. Um, you could have had a great like, role model as a person or young, amazing, uh, my yeah. dad. It was ridiculous. Amazing. Like, yeah. Sounds like a great man. Most most dads will go down the pub after work but because he was you he know was there every, yeah. he, he wanted to push so he, he would be like he was running five miles at f in 31 minutes at 42 wow don't even he's the, he was the, he, he was the oldest that. yeah exactly he was the oldest person ever to play in the FA Cup first round proper at 42 wow. marked Aaron McLean against Peterborough come off the bench like so seeing that you, I could see that hard work does pay off yeah if you if you push and push and push and keep going and something will happen and mm. you know Unfortunately, my career ended through injury, so there was nothing I couldn't have pushed in the yard, and I was because I and was. What's, what's that? What's that like dealing with that and having? Oh, that's having tough. To, yeah, that's tough. It, it took me. I was, I, if I'm honest, you know, I don't want to get all like sad and stuff. But well, this is this is this is the place to speak yeah. safely. And if I'm honest, I'm probably still not over it today, and that's probably why I pushed so hard coaching. Yeah, because I had so much to give physically and mentally and emotionally as a player. Still, that it was cut off so so sharp. I got a concussion. I got the last concussion on the Tuesday night of training. I was retired by Friday morning. Wow. And, you know, and that, it, it, for a while it was bad. Mm. 
and I, would, I, I just didn't want to do nothing. I gained loads of weight. Just anger, right? Oh yeah, bad. And then you probably still but inward, want, inward anger as oh, well. Oh, like ridiculous. It's only you just think it's all you know. And then threatening to cut every like you know everyone take all my mates take the piss out of me like, but I, I'll take it on the chin. I think it's funny as well. Like, like you've, you've had more comebacks than like is it, is it another comeback? And I'm talking, I think ah. Oh. So I still get phone calls to play now from good good from a good level. Like, yeah. I had a phone call last week. I ain't gonna mention the club, but they're you know two league below Premiership. Will you come and play? Blah blah blah. And I'm like, is that, I'm is off. Is that tough? Is that tough to say no oh, to? Yeah, and I'm off saying yes. I'm like, but then I think, no, you can't do that. Like your body's gonna. Yeah. I played. I played four games last year. I tried to make a comeback. Played four games. I was playing Saturday. I was only playing half an hour. A good level. You know, two leagues below Premiership. But you could be on. You could be on a rugby pitch for five minutes, and then you, you, something Friday, happens, and you're you're. In pain for for a week, oh, like, like, like I was doing catches things. your leg wrong, or you get pushed into. The, do you know what I mean? Then I played. I remember I played the first game jersey away, and by Friday morning I still hadn't recovered. I only played twenty minutes. Wow! I was absolutely battered. And I wow. thought, do you know what this ain't this ain't gonna happen? And it is um, it's chapters, isn't it? You know, yeah. I think I think the more success you start to get with this business, which congratulations, is booting oh, off you. right now, um, and you've got you've got a real intense, great project there. And yeah. The more you start to see the re the rewards from that. You know, it's going to be easier to to leave that leave that. In yeah, the past I've, I've, it's funny. I, I I think it was Monday morning. I actually said to my to my wife, I was like, I am. I actually think of myself now as Ricky the coach, not Ricky the athlete. Mm. So you know, it, it is a transition. It is hard to transition. I've got loads of friends that are ex pros. I'm in a WhatsApp group called Too Fat Too Thin. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're doing a. But at, least, at least you're all owning it, right? Yeah, <laughs> me and three mates are doing a half Iron Man. In, uh, in in August, all ex professionals in, in our sports. Where is it? What one? Uh, the London Half Ironman. Oh, really? So it's, yeah. a, it's a 10. So it's not, it's, it's not a sprint? No, it's an Olympic. It's an Olympic. <laughs> oh, wow. None of us have ever done a triathlon in our life. Really? Um, so yeah, me, Adam Hart, used to be a uh, two weight kickboxing world champion. Uh, ben Chorley played 500 games of football league. And then Billy Phillips, he was a professional hockey player, ice hockey. And all of us are the same person. We're all like, so competitive in the gym when Billy was sitting there one day let's, let's do a triathlon and we could have done the sprint and we could have done the sprint the long sprint yeah. but we decided to do the Olympic because that's what that's tough real men would do yeah apparently. that's a real challenge see I'm um I'm doing a challenge team podcast with my mate Chris and we are gonna build us he's booked um Ironman Western Australia for December the full one yeah and um I'm not sure if he's done a tri uh, any kind of triathlon yet, but I think triathlons are a super appealing thing because it's yeah. a lot of disciplines. Yeah. And um, you, you know, in a, there's a film I've seen where he goes, "I don't want to be the best at exercise, so you need something to actually do the exercise, train for, and then apply it to." Something I haven't got as a well. bike yet. Well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and I can't swim properly. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, yeah. no, How's your swimming? See, sw swimming's one of my swimming's one of my strongest. I'm points. 127 kilo. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what we should do. Um, the, you've been to the Olympic pool in Stratford? No, I've heard about it. It's amazing. Well, let's get up yeah. there. We'll do a little yeah, bit of we'll work out there we'll as well. Work, yeah. um, so as we've mentioned, your business is really going from strength yeah. to strength. One thing that I want to touch on as well is, which is a very important message for people, is that if you want to become a specialist, a business owner, whether it be a strength and conditioning coach or just run your own business, you've got to be willing to do the not putting them down, but the smaller jobs, basically the jobs that aren't your passion yeah. in order to get there. So let's let's rewind a little bit from where you're at with a business now. The business is called McFarlane Training Systems. Yes. On Instagram, everyone check it out, McFarlane Training Systems. Talk to me about the rise of that. Where's What was the initiation? How long has it been going for? And how have you got to where you are now, which is a successful strength and conditioning business? Uh, we've been running for about four years. Started off actually predominantly in football. Uh, was it because of the, the easy access for footballers from my dad? Mm. And then when Terry's success started to come and then had an influx of local amateurs and the success started to roll from there, um, it just snowballed. And it's almost been an uncontrollable snowball. Really? Um, we had a lot of wins. I think, for example, like last year, we must have had 80 fights between all the boys and we lost four. I remember you telling me, so wait, so last year, 2019, 80 fights, Four losses, yeah? Yeah. That's incredible. Amateurs, mate. pros. Must, must have been, yeah, six between. What's that, 5% loss rate? Yeah. It's decent. And like, and so what, had, and you're looking to improve that this year. If you improve that this year, then that is a testament to you. Yeah, like. Because you've got a lot of big fights this year as well. Huge. Mm. And we, we, a few boys, you know, Umar Sadiq, uh, Nigerian Olympic team, Frank Warren, he fights for Frank Warren. Uh, the one I'm proud of or the most is he hadn't stopped no one in his first five fights. In the last five fights, he stopped everyone. 
And, and has he been with you the whole time? Or four or five fights. For, for the last five fights that he stopped people in, he's been working with you yeah. for those fights. He joined your camp after his fifth fight. Yeah. And then he, he stopped Stops. every single... And yeah. he's, he, is, are we talking TKOs or are we talking... TKOs and KOs. And people are, he stopped people in the yeah, tracks. He's thundering people. Yeah. That's amazing. And, you know, like, it's all different things. Like, Umar comes to me saying, can you develop knockout power? Darren Stewart comes to me saying, can we improve my engine? It's, it's horses for courses, what they need. You know? And this is, again, one of the notes I've written down here is the equipment you use because I do see you working on the fundamentals, the compounds, the squats with the, what's the bar? The hex bar? Hex bar. Hex bar. And, um, and, but then I do see you using a lot of the resistance, the elasticated bands, people sprints, people holding while the other yeah. person's running and, um, and all the basic stuff. So yeah. how is it, is that all for YouTube? You've picked that up. Uh, no, reading books, everything, you know, uni, courses, I'm always learning. Because things have stepped up in the past. Oh, massive. Would you say, I mean, look, I'm sure if we're going up, up to the higher echelons of, of the training world, these, these resistant bands have probably been knocking about for 10, 20 years. But they have, would I be right in saying, trickled down to the more mainstream, tra more mainstream it's training. It's a powerless thing to start. Right. It was a so, that, so these bands, you know, see bit of brands around the knees with people doing the squats and yeah. increasing their glute uh, reaction and things like that. Um, that's something that's been around for a while but people yeah. you see everyone in the gym with them now right yeah yeah. and it, it started off uh, with a basketball coach in America going to Westside Barbell Louis Simmons he's mm. like a legendary strength conditioning coach and he um, attached them to a bar to work on accommodating resistance so as you, as you went through the stronger range of the motion the top of the strength curve it got harder. Mm. And then the, the the eccentric phase was accelerated, so you got that stretch shortening cycle. So when you're seeing people obviously like pushing up with a bar and then they've got the bands around it as well. Yeah. Um, I'm dying to get in for a session with you. Unfortunately, Ricky, Matt, I mean, we, we could talk for hours. I yeah. think that's all we've got time for. Um, but mate, great to see you. Let's get this swimming in. Let's start kicking on with these triathlons, shall we? Have a good go. Wicked, mate. Good to see you, man. Sweet, Rick. Bye.